Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday from 1 to 1.30 p.m. Uh, I'm your host, Danilo Cuellar, and today we're going to be uh, interviewing Luis Fernando Misis on Facebook, or Duran Aparicio, and uh, he's the host of the Anarchast, YouTube, Anarchast Español, uh, Emancipated Human on YouTube, and he's also the founder of the Facebook pages Black Markets Are Beautiful, Emancipated Human, and co-proprietor for V is for Voluntary. He runs the Dollar Vigilante Español in association with Jeff Borick of the, of the Dollar Vigilante. Um, and today we'll be discussing uh, shamanism and its role in uh, voluntarism and how it, uh, how it may help us to uh, defeat statism <laughs> or at least reduce it. So, um, Luis, uh, can you tell us a little about yourself? Uh, yes. Uh, well, as you mentioned, you know, I have a few pages and I collaborate with other eight pages as well. Um, my day work consists on uh, teaching voluntarism to the corporate arena. And uh, some of our clients actually are on the Forbes 100 best companies to work for. And uh, so basically what we're doing is uh, ditching uh, statism and moving towards voluntarism, which is empowering people and just basically leaving them alone to their work. Uh, and it's actually working really nicely to the point that they're making tons of money and they're enjoying their work. So uh, it's a win-win for everyone. Uh, as well as, you know, like uh, the work we do with um, the Dollar Vigilante. Um, yeah, we, we run the Spanish version of it. I get to help a little bit on the English one. So um, if you want to know a little bit more about economics, you can always go there. And Emancipated Human, which is uh, my newest baby, and we're working on that one. And uh, a little bit of uh, uh, shamanism on the side as well, trying to uh, just, I guess, help people on that realm as well. Yeah, that's pretty cool because I never really encountered um, a voluntarist shaman, although I'm sure that uh, they're, they're there. <laughs> we just don't know about them, right? Because... They're not necessarily as, um, um, how you say, public <laughs> as, you know, yeah. other healers, right? <laughs> They're not as, uh, I guess, accepted, right, in the mainstream? That's, that's the thing. I, I, don't, I don't know that we're not there, but it's kind of like we keep it hush-hush because it's seen as uh, a little bit weird. And, you know, to, to tell you the truth, I don't think that I would claim I'm a shaman, but more of a student of shamanism, yeah. which is a yeah. different story. Mm -hmm. um, and we can talk more about that later, but uh, there's a few friends, actually a handful, and we call ourselves the shamans with guns, uh, <laughs> you know, like the voluntarists that uh -huh. do a little bit of uh, healing work. So, yeah, it, it's pretty fun. Nice. All right, well, um, so let's uh, discuss what do you think, um, how do you think consciousness is linked to anarchy? I think that's a, kind of a tough question, but uh, the way I see it is um, kind of like the Tao, you know? So uh, um, we cannot force, we can force, but by forcing things, we are basically uh, bringing a lot of um, also um, attention to ourselves, and we don't necessarily want that. How can I explain this better? Um, live and let live, and... Um, do not aggress against others or their property and do what you say you're going to do kind of thing. And I think that goes beyond the physical realm. Um, and, and as a matter of fact, I guess I turned into anarchy because of, um, because of playing with my consciousness. Uh, <laughs> and I can tell you the story about that real quick. Sure. Um, it was pretty interesting because, um, I mean, I already knew about Ron Paul. And uh, I was uh, really uh, being seduced by the idea of uh, libertarianism. So I was there. Um, and then one of the things that, um, you know, I would drink some Pedro and just go ask questions. So one time I was like, you know, there's a lot of people that are like just fuzzing about money, you know. So money this, money that. If money didn't exist, life will be better. So, yeah, there's a bunch of people that have, you know, taken courses on, uh, you know, monetary policy and economics and so basically i just you know took some pedro one day asked a question and got in my tent and you know spend the next eight hours uh just figuring out all this stuff about money so 
Hmm. What I learned was that it was actually, San Pedro was telling me, you know, yeah, you can get rid of money. And I mean, if it, it could happen, but actually it's a very sophisticated way of trading goods, you know? So basically I got like a master's degree in like monetary policy in eight hours, <laughs> thanks to the San Pedro cactus. Nice. Um, so when, you know, it was kind of funny because he would take me like a couple of lifetimes, you know, it, it would be like an hour and then I will come back. Whew, because it gives you breaks. So it's like an hour of work and like 10, 15 minutes of like break. And then you go back into it. So it, it goes in waves. So, you know, I will get like a lesson and then, you know, maybe eat a lot, a couple of uh, sesame uh, chips and then go back to it. And then so back and forth. And at the end of the day, I was able to see why is it so important to have, you know, all these voluntary interactions and through a method that was... Um, making it easier for everybody everybody to trade which was money now money when i say money i don't mean uh, fiat currency that has been inflated and there's a bunch of uh, uh crooks doing a bunch of things to it like you know like uh, the austrian economic um, definition of money that's what i mean so you know that was like the first the first time that i did some like deep work on um, that kind of stuff with san pedro and and it went pretty deep. Nice. Yeah, I, um, you know, I think a lot of people confuse um, when we say the word drugs, right? Like, like you know, we, we talk about the war on drugs, and um, and and there that war on drugs is implying hallucinogenic plants, right? Also, as well as um, um, I guess that those plants that have been refined and made so much more potent than they naturally would be, like cocaine and heroin and all that kind of stuff, right? So uh, I think that a differentiation needs to be made between what I consider to be drugs, which is more the, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical medications, right, from big pharmaceutical companies that are, uh, you know, of course, special interest groups and intimately involved in government, and um, plants that stimulate... Um, you know, opening the third eye and like, you know, learning about profound truths, <laughs> right? About our, you know, about consciousness, about about our existence and things like that. And and perhaps that is a threat to the state, right? And that might be a reason why um, it may be, uh, you know, it's resisted or it's banned, right? W what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that your loving government is banning uh, drugs not because they care about you, you know, like, um, you know, running out of your house and getting hit by a car or jumping out of a 25th floor you know I think they do that because it um, takes you and shakes you out of the standardism of life and makes you see things from a different perspective and it helps you like it lifts up the veil of um, the illusion that you can be controlled you know uh, I guess like we kind of buy that truth but we don't really um, think much about it because it's just a given. So this, I mean, a lot of people are able to do this without, you know, teaching plants. But the teaching plants make the process really fast. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, 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 it works on different levels. Like, number one, it shakes you out of your normal perspective. Uh, it helps you heal a lot of emotional wounds, a lot of uh, uh, psychological wounds. And it even heals a lot of physical ailments. So it's a win-win, you know, anywhere you see it. It helps you, uh, like, whenever you take it, or even ayahuasca, it, it goes to certain parts of your brain, uh, like, really, um, all parts of your brain, like, when you're really tiny, or even, you know, in the womb, developing your brain still, like, uh, uh, where all the old memories are stored. So you're able to tap into that. So imagine, like, it, it's able to heal a lot of traumas that people have had from being in your mom's belly. Wow. Now that's pretty fancy. <laughs> so, nice. um, I mean, you're able to also do this through uh, some, uh, like the timeline therapy, for instance, uh, a little uh, cognitive or maybe even guest cell therapy. But again, this is just another tool that people can use and you can do it in, you know, one or two sessions, you know, and uh, it, it works really nicely. So, yes, it opens you up to a different perspective to the point where you just like, I can take responsibility for my own life. <laughs> I don't need a, you know, daddy figure to look after me because I actually am 
an adult. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, whenever like Lou Rockwell says that the minute that, you know, they don't have a hold of your mind, that's when the state starts losing. Mm -hmm. So this is what the teaching plants are able to do. They, they just take that out and you're kind of a, a free person and that's scary to them. Definitely, definitely. Um, all right, so how about, um, I'm just curious, the, the history of shamanism and the particular type of shamanism that you practice, how would you, how would you describe it? Okay, the history of shamanism, like shamanism is probably the most ancient form of spirituality. But see, the cool thing about this is um, what shamanism does or has done for thousands of years is that it allows uh, every individual to bring the truth out from themselves. So it's not something that is given from one priest and saying, you know, this is the truth, you read this book and then I am able to interpret that for you. No, no, no. Like what shamanism does is it turns it into a personal journey. So, you know, when people come to the shaman, the shaman gives them a drink and then you drink it and then it's in, in completely internal. It's an internal um, trip or voyage or whatever you want to call it. So you go inside and deal with all your shit, all your demons, all your problems, all your traumas, and then you emancipate yourself. And so, you know, that, that's happened for thousands of years. And it just uh, is passed on, you know, through, I guess, again, voluntary interactions, whoever is called to this. And the one that I um, do is, um, I don't even, I mean, it's part of the sheep boat, but I guess... Um, it has to do with the Peruvian, um, you know, movement of, like, the shamans um, through Ayahuasca and San Pedro. And, like, these two guys are uh, really different entities with themselves. You know, like, Ayahuasca is a motherly female energy. Really, uh, you can probably uh, think of Ayahuasca as a really stern grandma that says, You're going to clean your room, you little shit, and I will not take no for an answer. So it puts you in the washer machine and you go and then you clean your room and then you clean your guts and you puke and then you shit your pants mm. and you cry and like you after that, you know, you I mean, you even die, you know, you experience death probably many mm. times and then you come back and you mm. feel a new person, you know, there is the rebirth, you know, but then whenever you do the rebirth, it's kind of like the movie The Matrix when Neo comes back after he gets shot several times by Agent Smith, you know, like, he's yeah. like, Wong. and then, yeah. like, life is just different. Yeah, like, yeah, you yeah. can see more things. Like, it opens your pineal gland, and you're able to, like, your awareness increases. So you have increased uh -huh. awareness. So anyway, uh, Ayahuasca is from the valley, so it's dark. It's a strong energy. You know, and San Pedro is from, you know, the mountains. So it's a really bright energy. It's a male energy. It's kind of like an old, nice granddad, you know, that takes you by the hand and walks you around and, you know, teaches you with stories and lets you see all this. And then after the whole round, you're like, oh, look what I figured out. But in reality, he took you by the hand all along for you to see that. But, hmm. you know, it's so, like, cool that he doesn't necessarily take the credit for it. It's like, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. good job finding out. <laughs> so... It's, I guess in, it's more forgiving. Um, and I, I like to work with San Pedro because of that. Uh, it seems to be a little more, um, um, I don't know. Okay, so, so the thing is, San Pedro is the one that told me, it's like, okay, dude, this is your calling. You need to do this. You have the gift. So um, if you choose to do so, I'm going to be here. You come back. So, you know, I mean, that was the first time I took it. And I was like, holy shit. You know, I mean, that's a ton of responsibility. So, um, and there's, you know, many, many of us that are doing this, you know. Um, so, at any rate, you know, kind of like the white cells of your blood, if mm -hmm. you will, you know, eating the bacteria. So, that's kind of like, you know, like Mission Impossible, if you choose to accept it, kind of mm -hmm. thing. So, um that's, I mean, does that answer the question? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good, yeah. No, no, you know, there's not, there's not too much that I know about this, um, you know, in the specific detail that you're talking about, so it's great, yeah. 
Um, I, I, but I, but you just reminded me of a book I read. Um, I forget the name. It's this guy. This I think he's like an ethnobotanist in the United States, and he goes down to the Amazon jungle, and he um, he goes to uh, Terence McKenna. No, 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 not not him. No, um, forget his name. The, um, but he goes down to this um, this uh, this uh, you know tribe of uh, natives, and and they're you know of course um, the with the shamans as I guess um, I guess as their natural surroundings you know it gets less and less, and they get um, I say pushed off their land somehow. Um, the the shamans are not able to pass down their knowledge to the successive generations. And so he's basically, you know, going down there to try to document their knowledge oh, that's and interesting. the plants that they, you know, that they know about, right? And uh, and what their function is. And uh, I think it's called something like the yellow jaguar, maybe something like that. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta go look it up. But um, but yeah, yeah, it was really, really fascinating. And and I remember one one uh, <laughs> portion in the book where he was out hunting, and. Uh, and of course, they were using the blow darts, right? With the uh, I don't know how you say curare, curare. Are you familiar with that? Where it's like it's like the frog poison that they they process it and they boil it and they concentrate it down into a very um, poisonous substance, and then they just tip the ends of the blow darts, right? Yeah. And and it, it um, it's so so quick acting that. Um, I think it's like once it enters the bloodstream, it like causes paralysis within a few seconds. It like circulates very quickly, and and ho however, it causes um, paralysis, but it doesn't like you know um, contaminate the meat. Oh. <laughs> so you know, so it's not it's like the meat is poisonous. So it's kind of kind of interesting how that, <laughs> that, that is, works. But that's pretty cool. But I remember uh, one, one part in the book where he, they were they were going monkey hunting, right? And he shot a blow dart in the air, like pretty much. Up in the air, the guy, the guy did the, the native, and he missed the monkey, and then the blow dart came down and it just scraped his um, his arm, and then he looked at he looked at the guy, the author of the book, and he's like, he's like, goodbye, <laughs> and then it just collapses right there. It's like that quick, and I I, I guess it's like certain death because it uh, paralyzes you know paralyzes everything, including your diaphragm. Yeah, right, so, you're done. So. Um, so yeah, so quite quite powerful, but uh, but yeah. Do you know much about uh, about that um, um, shamanism in the Amazon or in the in uh, yeah in the South America? Is um, it very different than than no, uh, that's what you know. Basically, where it comes from. But see, there are different kinds. Like these, um, I, there's so many kinds, you know, and and within the kinds they mix and match and and. Honestly, because there's a lot of influx. Okay, so basically, you know, the the center of uh, energy until probably 10 years ago was in Tibet. So mm -hmm. it shifted to Peru. So now we're seeing a bunch of people drinking ayahuasca and, you know, like going to San Pedro. So like there's a lot of energy and a lot of influx of people and there, there has been for a while. So there's even more... Um, so basically, uh, ayahuasca was saying, you know, we're kind of uh, dwindling down, so we need to explode because the world needs this kind of healing. So um, when that happened, uh, it started like leaping out of um, Peru. So, you know, there's accounts of people that they take some things from the tribe or the tradition and they mix it with their own so there's really not like you know this block here kind of like saying judaism catholicism or uh, okay. you know, i mean there's not those boxes if you will yeah. uh -huh. even if there are uh, you know a couple of main <clears throat> ones they still uh, bleed out to different things especially because I guess people from the United States are going there and we are, I mean, as it is, we are a pretty libertarian nation here. So, you know, we don't really like rules. Mm -hmm. So if it's something that we don't see profitable or like um, if it doesn't quite make a lot of sense, we kind of don't do it. Mm -hmm. Right. So like whenever I get to help people with the practice, you know, like I don't do a lot of rituals. I clear the space, I hold space, we drink and we're in bam. So there's not a lot of, um, 
like um, ceremony, if you will. I, yeah, that, that, yeah, that's what I was going to ask because when I when I was reading about shamanism, that's that's a big part of it, right? Is the dancing and the chanting and, and ceremonial, right? Yeah, I mean, process. there's a time and a place for everything, you know, like the drums and all that. They do get you into a trance, and and it's so wonderful. But like, I guess the the way that um, like the specialty that I go to is like just the healing part, you know, like the drinking, going deep, more like psychoanalysis. So yeah, there is the part of drums, and people specialize in that and. Mm. It's just like, I mean, it varies anywhere okay. from changing or uh, <clears throat> suggesting changes in diet mm -hmm. to exorcisms, you know, and anywhere, in, anything in between. Wow. So, like, you know, uh, you can see the person and, and, like, you can offer a little more cinnamon if they need more fire in their stomach, you know, because they have a lot of uh, cold. And anywhere to, like, you know, I've done poltergeist you know, from afar, like with a lady in Pennsylvania, me being here in Texas, just kind of like astral traveling. And really? Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. And that stuff is pretty exciting. I mean, it's wow. kind of scary at times, I'm going to be honest, but it's it's kind of cool <laughs> to be able to do those things. So um, what would you say the relationship is between shamanism and religion? Because it seems like, I, I don't know if you would call it religion or a religious component, but it seems like it's certainly a spiritual practice, right? But would you necessarily say it's religious practice also? I think that's kind of like saying I'm a, a vegetarian that eats steak. Yeah? Yeah, like uh, religion and shamanism are just polar opposites. Because is, that, is that mainly because, like, um, because you're talking about because of the healing um, part of it? I'm saying it because, like, with religion you have to, um, like, here is the truth. And you have to accept it and believe it to be able to go oh, to the see, kingdom see, of heaven yeah, versus shamanism is find out. I see, I see, yeah. So, so you're not being told what is true, you're discovering it for yourself. Right? And the funny part is that most people get to kind of the same thing, you know, like when mm -hmm. they really get to discover all this stuff. So mm -hmm. and it ends up being complete like opposites from this stuff. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really like that's another thing why I kind of compare a little bit with uh, voluntarism because it's not like rules, prescriptions. It's more like here's this drink, heal yourself and find out the meaning of life, you know, mm -hmm. kind of thing. So it just takes you lifetimes to, uh, you know, beyond the Big Bang and like, I mean, there's endless possibilities. Wow. So it's not like. You don't have to believe. And even the Buddha said, you know, do not believe things even if I say them to you. Just yeah. go find out. Mm -hmm. You know, because like it really does, like the way that you understand the universe is different than the way I understand the universe. So if I just take your word for it, even though I really like you and I think you're a cool guy, uh, your ex life experiences may not translate to my life experiences. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to have different results. Mm -hmm. um, that makes sense. So, yeah, uh, I mean, you have one perspective of the universe, I have another one, and somebody else has another one, you know? So, like, if I say, you know, like, for instance, my hand is like this, and, oh, it's, uh, you know, concave, or no, it's, you know, like, I mean, we're seeing the mm -hmm. same thing, but it's just different angles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, I guess, the difference between, you know, religion and shamanism and, like, the individual anarchy path from mm -hmm. here. Cool, wow. Very good. Um, yeah, shamanism is uh, yeah, it's always something I've been quite fascinated in. And I haven't tried any hallucinogenic plants myself, <laughs> so I, I, should probably, I should, should probably do that to, to just uh, you know, see how it is. I think that would be pretty cool. But you mentioned also kind of interesting, um, you, were, you were talking about like heat, you know, taking warm herb, herbs for a cold condition, right? Which yeah. is... I would attribute to uh, uh, ch traditional Chinese medicine, um, uh, you know, paradigm. So is that is that what you were uh, referring to, or? Yeah, and you know, like uh, let thy medicine be thy food, and let thy food be thy medicine, kind of yeah. thing. And that stuff comes from yeah. I mean, like people or uh, uh, tribes that have gone like really deep into healing, you know, they're able to see those truths. So. Um, I do think that there is a time and a place for uh, Western medicine. Mm -hmm. I mean, I if I have a headache that is killing me, which I usually don't, but like the one or two I get every five years, I do take Advil. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not afraid of stuff. Yeah. Um, although my wife would not take Advil, you know, she's more like uh, anti-chemical kind of thing. I am not afraid of using bleach in my house, you know, although, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm not. Uh, my, my wife, you, you know, buys the one from Whole Foods that is not really bleach. It's like bleachless bleach or uh-huh. some kind of cleaner stuff. Uh, yeah. And, you know, so I guess what I'm trying to say is like, yes, a lot of these things come from like really natural things that you can just heal through. I mean, it's, it's chemistry, you know, that's mm-hmm. what it boils down to. So you, if you have a, a deficiency of something, just take something to make up for that deficiency and that's it. Yeah. Or if you have too much of this, you know, put something on this side to balance it out. And I mean, that's, that's what it is. And I, it, it, it's not something that you just like learn overnight. It does. I mean, as you well know, it does take a little while yeah. to, like know what the hell is happening and you know even individualized services because there's like not a one size fits all kind of thing so you have to like each person is different you have to see their doshas you know like more Mm -hmm. like hindu uh, ayurvedic Mm -hmm. kind of style thing so um and the more tools that like i mean i'm a yoga instructor i know about ayurveda you know like a little bit of shamanism um akashic records and you know tarot like Mm -hmm. nutrition so uh, I think that having a lot of uh, tools under your belt allow you to see a broader, broader perspective on uh, healing, you know? So it's not just like uh, take an aspirin for everything kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Wait, you said, you said tarot? You do ta- tarot card also? Yeah. Wow. I did not know that. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it, uh, it's not my preferred style. Uh-huh. You know, but I do know how to do it. Um, it was actually a witch from England that taught me how to read the tarot. Was, really? Yeah. Wow. That was pretty cool. I mean, I've gotten into some interesting things in my life. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. So, so I would I would assume if if someone wanted to learn shamanism, uh, it, I would assume the best thing would be to apprentice under some right some find somebody an apprentice yes because I, I wouldn't assume a uh, any university would be teaching this <laughs> is it true yeah mean? no no yeah i did learn under a guy that actually has the center in peru at this time so uh, my friend um i'm not gonna mention his name but like he was uh he kind of tapped me on the shoulder and you, he just saw it on me too he's like hey i think you should try this because i i, I feel that you're into Mm. this you know so we started talking and you know after you know i guess he screened me you know uh before he actually asked me about it so he was telling me and talking and then so we went to his house and we had it and then um i mean several times and then he took me to another place that a guy was serving something different and we took it and like that was the very, very first time that I took ayahuasca, it was with him, but with other people, like, I had it. And everybody was, like, after an hour, everybody was, like, crying or puking or whatever. And I would not see anything or feel anything. I was just like, okay. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. And then um, then I just, like, lost sight of everything. Everything turned black. And I just uh. saw this huge snake coming out. And then I was like, like I felt I was going to die. And she said, you're not ready for me yet. And disappeared. And I saw everything again. And I did not feel anything. So that was like out of the eight hour trip or five hour trip, five minutes. And that was uh, like, kind of like patting me on the head. Like you little boy, you're not quite ready for me yet. (laughs) I was like, holy shit, that was scary. (laughs) You know, but okay. A couple of months before this. Um, I had a vivid dream. Uh, we have vaulted ceilings in our living room. And so I was dreaming that I, I saw this huge head of an anaconda just rolling into my living room just with one eye. And it was the freakiest thing because I did not sense that it was evil, but I did not sense that it was good either. So I was like, I don't know what to do with you, you know? And then she just went out again. And then a couple of days later is when I, I, my friend told me, hey, let's go do this. So it, it it was an interesting dream, kind of like saying, "Okay, you're next, buddy." <laughs> Can you share with with us the um, the name of the um, university in in Peru? Uh, it's not it's not a university. Or, it's or, just, or it's is, a center. A center, okay. Yeah, um, 
I don't even know the name of the center, but I mean, there's tons of centers. I have a friend that goes to the Hummingbird Retreat in uh, okay. Peru, and then like there's a bunch in um, Arequipa and Iquitos. Yeah, uh, I think my friend's in Iquitos. And, okay. Um, cool. No, actually, my friend's pretty close to Lima. So yeah, there's a ton of places now because of that same thing, and because it's actually legal in Peru. There's uh, you have to be really careful and not just go to anybody because there's some people that actually do take advantage of uh, people. So uh, do your research very well if you want to go down there. Um, so like the the. You mean you mean while they're in the trance, they take advantage? Yeah, like they take your oh. money and then they like smack you or rape you or. Wow. You know, like, so you have to be careful with who you go with. Uh, yeah, so yeah, the yeah. Hummingbird Retreat, which is the one that comes to mind that my friend has gone to, that one's pretty legit. People are really good. And then the other one's Blue Morpho. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard you know, good things and, uh, about them. and um, So, I mean, uh, there's a bunch of good places there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, because I'm half Peruvian, so I've been to Peru many times um, in uh, in the past, and and I've been to Lima, to Ica, to uh, Cusco. Um, wow, yeah, but I did never uh, <laughs> never had this experience. So, uh, so is this is this like in Peru? This um, has origins from the Incas. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Wow. See, I never. I didn't really, because um, hmm. I, I did learn, you know, a, a bit about the Inca history. There's a book I read called the uh, The Last of the Incas, and it basically told there, you know, from uh, I guess, you know, all the way back thousands, you know, thousands of years, and, and you know, and then all the all the little tribes that they conquered to form the Inca Empire, which is enormous. Um, but uh, yeah, I never. I never read about the shamanism part of it, though. Yeah, but you know, for the most part, like you know, people that are, are into shamanism, they're like, um, uh, you know, black market ish kind of thing. Even in those times, you know, like the empire had power <laughs> and didn't want you know a bunch of free people either. So I mean, there's always that kind of thing going on. Oh, okay, so, okay. I mean, they had their, you know, um, I guess priests of sorts. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean. Uh, it, there's a good book, um, uh, why, uh, well, shit, something about the failure of uh, big civilizations, and I can post it on the comments down below, so that mm. it kind of talks about that, how, you know, that same uh, thing of wanting too much power is what makes mm. everything go to hell, but anyway, yeah, that's, that's it comes from there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and also, so, so you said basically when, when somebody would drink it, then they would have their own journey, right? So... So it's not really like it's it's not really like you're going to a psychotherapist and and you're talking and he's talking and you're both talking, right? This is it sounds more like an individual journey. W would you say that's correct? Um, whenever we do it and I hold space, it really depends on the person. Okay. Like when I do my own, I don't like talking to anybody. I just go in and deep and you know, like I I write, I write my experience. Mm -hmm. um, I keep my iPad or the MacBook and just, you know, type it up. Um, but whenever I do it with people, you know, to help them out, a lot of them do talk. And that is actually really beneficial and helpful, especially with San Pedro, because you're able to, although kind of wobbly, you're able to walk, you're able to speak. So it's kind of helpful to have... Um, that other person you know to be able to connect and especially like when I'm there and able to see what they're seeing um, they feel heard they feel understood and then we're able to process things and walk through things and if I need to do other things we do things you know like clearing or cleansing or whatever it's needed at the time mm -hmm. we do it and and there's periods you know like I told you it's in cycles there's like a couple of hours that people just no contact at all, you know. Mm -hmm. So it really varies. Hmm. Fascinating. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, there's not much. Uh, I guess I. I mean, I did. I did learn more when I was younger. My my teenage years. I read a bunch of uh, books on shamanism in the North American Native Native Americans. Would you Would you say that's where what you learned stems from? North American tradition, or is it's it's more generalized than that? It's more South American. More South American. Okay, okay. Yeah, like. So, 
So know, the North Americans, they also use those, the San Pedro and Well, Ayahuasca? North American people use peyote and ah, I see, I see. Uh, other kinds of mushrooms, you know, like uh, yeah, Central America, you know, like Mexico kind of thing, uh, the s southern parts of Mexico. Now, North America, um, peyote, you know, like northern parts of Mexico and the United States, mm -hmm. um, they used uh, peyote for that and other plants. Is there a reason that you don't use peyote, or, or just because you you know you you don't have uh, history with it, or they've invited me, but to be quite honest, I don't think I'm ready for it. Really? Yeah. Hmm. So it's like another level of. I don't know that it's higher by any by any means, but I just don't feel quite drawn to it yet. Okay. So, <laughs> like, an, a one that I would love to do is iboga, and I found a place in Costa Rica, and this is a plan from. Africa and like one of my friends just went to Costa Rica to do it there and um, This one is a 30-hour experience Wow <laughs> And it kicks your ass you can't move you have to get help to go pee What really yeah, because you're like, you know, so it basically Forces you to go inwards and you wow. work a lot. It's gentle. It's like San Pedro kind of gentle Okay, but it makes you work so mm. you process a ton of stuff, 30 hours. That's mm. like three times San Pedro, four times <laughs> San Pedro. Wow. So um, that, that's something, you know, like um, it's a, an African spirit that I would like to. And that's I Iboga, is it? Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. Fascinating. <laughs> I would like to learn under Iboga. I think that would be kind of cool. So, so is there any um, age... Uh, I guess restrictions like like you wouldn't recommend you know children do this kind of stuff or like is there a cutoff point you would say okay now <laughs> you can do it would you say well or there's you people like you know in Peru and their tribes that they live they let you know their seven year old six year olds drink a little bit mm -hmm. you know they give them a little more diluted version or maybe even less of it but they give it to them mm -hmm. Uh, even they just kind of like dab, you know, the babies just a little bit. Really? <laughs> yeah. So, wow. I mean, I, I I don't know that I'm necessarily quite willing to do that with like little ones, you know. <laughs> Is I guess there a like reason? yeah. Um, I don't like to help if I'm not asked. Oh, know? I see. So again, a little more of the voluntarist ideology, you know, like, yeah, I'm here and I'll be able to help anytime, anywhere, but yeah. um, I am not going to intervene unless you ask. I mean, if yeah. I see, of course, if somebody's like stealing, you know, like if somebody's being robbed, I'm going to intervene, but like for mm -hmm. this kind of stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it's kind of like, um, you know, when people talk about like circumcision, you know, uh, <laughs> right? Like, uh, you know, the, the parents may think it's the right thing to do, but you know, um, at least give the child a choice, right? Maybe they, they're going to want to do it later in life, but at least give them the choice, right? That's so, the way I see it. Yeah, so I agree with that. All right, so uh, it seems like our time is about up. Um, it's great talking to you, Luis. You. Um, we'll do this again soon. So this is... Uh, actually, do you want to you wanna finish up with anything? Um, before we sign off? Yeah, I am not a doctor. You should never take my advice. And I only say this because the FDA regulates everything. So <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble and I don't want to, um, you know, I guess just end up in jail. So everything that I said was for, um, what is the word? Um, educational purposes. Yeah, educational purposes. <laughs> This video is not meant to diagnose or treat any treat, illness. Yeah, treat <laughs> so or... You should include the whole uh, list <laughs> disclaimer. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the funniest thing, you know, like on, on some of the drugs that appear on TV is like, this may cause death, dismemberment, <laughs> heart attacks, and then you see people leaping on like fields yeah. of flowers. You're like, what's exactly. that? Exactly. <laughs> but don't worry about it. <laughs> it's just some fat guy reading fast words. It's not really, not really significant. <laughs> yeah. All right. Very good. Um, is there any, any place additionally you want people to reach you? or? Uh, well, yeah, just Emancipated Human on Facebook. And we're actually starting a website, emancipatedhuman.com. That's probably going to come up within the next few weeks. Um, and in, even when I launch it, it's not going to be completely ready. We're going to be just posting articles. So just um, bear with me, you know, the mess. 
and I am grateful that you uh, asked me to join your fabulous show. No problem. Well, definitely uh, going to do it again soon. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So this is um, that's it for this uh, episode of um, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. I'm the host, Neil Aquare, and wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. <laughs>